Uh, thank you very much. Um, anything from finance? Thank you. Um, uh, questions from uh, committee members? Sue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to thank the expertise of the panelists as well as the many members of the public that have come to discuss this incredibly important set of questions, both regards to the need as well as how our state provides care in a humane way and in a way that makes sense within our budget constraints. I know that there have been at least 14 states that have transitioned to close all their institutions as well as obviously a number of uh, developmental centers in the state of California. My question to the panelists are, could you talk a little bit about what lessons have been learned both in other states as well as within California about how to transition from development, state-run developmental centers to being back in the community? Uh, what, what, what has been learned? Uh, what pitfalls should we avoid? wondering if there are folks that have any high-level uh, comments or advice about that. Um, uh, Mr. Chu, I'm happy to uh, represent the department's experience with the closure at um, Lannerman. One of the things that we found was beneficial was uh, a clear line of communication between the department and the regional centers. Obviously, the department provides funding to the regional centers to develop residences in the community. And so it's, it's important to understand the needs of the individuals because clearly as the developmental centers downsize, the individuals that remain are typically the most difficult to serve in the community, whether it's because of enduring medical needs or because of challenging behaviors. So what we found was it was very critical to have uh, constant communication with our regional center partners. Uh, in the case of Lannerman, there were uh, approximately 12 regional centers that were involved in finding community housing for individuals. So there were weekly meetings. Uh, the staff in our community services division did an outstanding job of staying on top of things, making sure that there were phone calls and status updates. So I think probably the lesson we learned was that in order to make transitions successful, in order to ensure that they occur on time and to avoid placement of any individual into another developmental center, which is what occurred when we closed Lannerman, we did not, everyone was placed into the community and I think that was due to the hard work of our staff and the regional center staff. Let's go. Yes, uh, Assemblymember, member, let me just add um, in uh, the experience, the, the, the extraordinary experience, because uh, you asked a great question, um, with the closure of Agnes Developmental Center. Um, one of the first things that we did in the community-based uh, planning for that is to ask and seek the answer to the questions you asked uh, through other states in the United States. Um, looking at uh, the key part of a foundation is intimate participation for all those involved. As simple as that sounds, uh, the task of doing that um, requires a, a great deal of vigilance. And as we did at Agnews, um, bringing uh, stakeholders, all the stakeholders, um, beginning with the individuals who live there and their families, and the community at large, because Agnews had a history in that geographic area of being one of the facilities that you heard about before, had over 2,000 people living there. Um, and two different campuses. And the order of one campus, the West Campus, closing years before um, was significantly different than when the East Campus closed that I'm speaking of now. It was a community-based strategic plan, just as you would uh, if you're building a brand new business from scratch. Um, and the, the success of it came from the networking with the, with the community at large, always, always, with the families and the individuals themselves. Thank you. We have a question from Member Groves. Grove. Thank you. Thank you. That's okay, Mr. Thank you. Dion, if I could make you queen for the day, I would, and I would allow you to close these facilities and move all the money to the community. The guy's name was Jack Bailey or something, wasn't it? Pardon me? The guy who ran queen for a day, his name was Jack Bailey. Yeah. If I could make you queen you for the day, I would make sure that you were in charge and you'd close these facilities yeah. and give the money to the community, okay, so that our community is taken care of. It took eight years to close Agnews. It took four years to close Latterman. I think we're getting better at closure and quicker and more efficient and taking care of the, or the consumers better. 
and giving them fuller lives, like Richard going from restraints, restraints and medication to playing the piano in a recital. And he had behavioral issues because he wanted to play the piano and there were no keys on the piano and nobody took the time to see that through except for when he got to the community. That's the difference. And I hope you guys got that. And Jerome, I didn't know he got married. He testified here last year and last session several times. He's, um, that what a great photo and a great guy and his story is wonderful. So I'm glad that he got married. So um, my question is why 10 years, I guess, with the LAO's office? If we've done Ag News in eight years and we did more people in Ag News than we have available in the facilities now, again, we're not talking about Porterville, nobody is. Four years for Latterman, and we have 10 years on the books now. What's 18 months, two years? What's, how come we can't do it in two years? Sure, Assemblymember Grove, when we um, made the recommendation to close both facilities within 10 years, it was out of a, a concern for the health and safety of the existing DC residents and also consideration of the capacity of the department. And we understand that there is a particular expertise that's required to develop community resources and develop the transition plans and ensure that all the residents are successfully transitioned to the community. And we didn't want to sacrifice or uh, compromise um, those policy concerns in closing the DCs. So uh, my hope, and I was very excited when I met Mr. Uh, Santee Rogers, and um, I went back and read his bio and what he's done. My hope is that the administration put this man in that position because he has experience closing DCs. Um, so hopefully that's, that's what's actually taking place, I would hope. Yes? I believe we have experience and also have the humility to expand what experience we do have of the lead time it takes. And just as a, a part of uh, the history of it, that during the uh, time period, uh, I think we might have talked earlier about this, is that there was a, there was a, uh, in the closure of Agnes, a, a delay because we never had a governor recalled before. Right. And during that course of it, it's a part of our history, that those are events that aren't scheduled always. And it adds to it. the. The four years, about a four, four and a half years of con concerted effort and uh, improvement on our abilities to build certain levels of service, we put out in the front end uh, a, a idea of people with enduring medical needs that we needed another way of demonstrating the better serving them in a small living arrangement. And that took more time by itself and they were the last persons to leave the developmental center. So that adds to the time period. But I know what I'm trying to s suggest to you is that you look at the strategic plan and the purpose is to make sure you do it in a safe, meaningful way as we both agree on um, and that meets the best meets the needs of each individual. And I think we accomplished that. We, we had a conversation in my office. We talked about money that came from the D.C. centers underneath the department's budget. And when the D.C. centers were closed or people left the D.C. centers, the money was returned back to the general fund. What mechanism do we or can you advise us on how we as legislators would ensure that the $500 million, um, almost a half a billion dollars that's used to fund what? a total of 700 people we're talking about because we're not messing with Porterville. How do we take that half a billion dollars and make sure it goes at least partially to the community along with all the equipment, the special beds, the wheelchairs, the breathing equipment so that the community doesn't have to repurchase that stuff again and it follows the consumer. And I, I, the, Does Mr. Thurman need to pass a bill? Well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think Should I take that as co-authorship? <laughs> that works. <laughs> I, I think what's important to keep in mind in such a situation is that there are, um, there are ongoing operational costs related to the developmental center so that until the developmental center is actually closed and um, staff are given notice and uh, in, in a lot of cases they're able to move to other state institutions or work in the community. Uh, there are ongoing fixed costs that we have. So uh, I think t to do what you're proposing would require uh, not only the legislature to uh, consider how, what method they want to use to do that, but it would also require that 
the uh, facilities would have to be completely uh, closed and you know there could there would be incremental savings that if it was the will of the the governor and the legislature to redirect those funds that could occur but it, it would have to be an incremental process I, I with the regional or with the developmental centers up and running uh, again there are costs that will occur whether there's you know 500 people or five people so. right so and I understand that but that that would be the argument for closing them more expeditiously as well so that that money could move to the community in a faster manner um, to sustain an, a great lifestyle for the people that are in there now and the community that's starving um, I do have questions that I thought were going to be gone over uh, aside from the DC's closing and things like that the decertification of Sonoma the four ICF units and I don't know who's going to answer this uh, the state of California had to backfill the budget because we lost significant federal funds totaling I don't know 8.8 .8 million 8.9 million close to nine million dollars um, that was for a half a year's budget or one budget because a two-year budget cycle so or so you have that and then it wasn't it wasn't uh, the federal government didn't recertify those units so now we're going to backfill it again for the 15-16 budget and then um, my understanding from CMS is that you recently got a letter Thursday or Friday that they're going to decertify more units in Sonoma so the federal government doesn't think that Sonoma has a facility that's adequate for these people to reside in and yet we're still funding it to be open and backfilling from our budget can you tell me what the letter said are they going to decertify those additional units and pull an additional 43 million is that what it is 11 ICF units totaling 43 million dollars so if can you tell me if they are going to pull the funding are you in negotiations with them to try to keep the funding and if so how is that going um, let us know because we're a budget sub one and we're going to have to make a decision and we're going to be forced I think like we were last little budget cycle to backfill a failing institution that just recently the Supreme Court ruled that we could have access to all the abuse records that took place so we have a huge monumental failure that I don't want to backfill well to address your first question about the units that are decertified the department did voluntarily decertify four intermediate care facility units at Sonoma and it will cost approximately nine million dollars general fund per year to operate those units uh, regarding the let we did receive a letter from uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services their region 9 office indicating that they were extending the funding for um, the seven units that are currently out of certification they're going to extend that funding through April 11th of what year uh, I'm sorry April 11th of this current year oh this 20. current year yes. so after April 11th correct we're and uh, the the um, Health and Human Services Agency is in discussions with uh, CMS regarding uh, the status of Sonoma and um, how to move forward there because obviously the um, federal government has made it clear CMS has made it clear that uh, they are not fond of institutional living and um, uh, while they have agreed to continue to fund uh, the seven units for another 45 days uh, the um, administration the, the Health and Human Services Agency secretary is in discussion with CMS about how to move forward what, what's the anticipated money that's going to cost for this is last year's budget that will have to be adjusted to cover after the April 11th right if if we have to fund the all 11 units for an entire year it would cost about 44 million dollars general fund so we're losing 44 million dollars in federal funds yes. because the Sonoma is an archaic institution that has not met the standards for living conditions for these people well again you know there are concerns uh, both Department of Public Health and CMS has concerns about the intermediate care facility units the nursing facility units at Sonoma there is not an issue of certification and residents uh, in, in, in our opinion in all units receive excellent care but um, in this particular case again we are discussing with the federal government how to move forward 
Okay, um, can we talk about Fairview for a second? Mm -hmm. So the program improvement plans at Fairview and Porterville DCs, and again, Porterville, I'm not so much concerned with them because I get the whole thing behind the fence. I get that we need these emergency 32 beds because there's people inside the jails that, you know, constitutional rights being violated. I get that. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really, I get that. Um, but uh, what about um, the federal funding that has not been lost in these DCs yet? Does that money, that $12.2 million, does it come from the general fund for the 179 positions that you're requesting? Like if we, if we take that $43 million and you don't ask for additional money for Sonoma, maybe we can take that $43 million that we're losing and fund some of these positions or Again, my uh, my fight for the last two years that I have here in the state assembly is to get as much money to the community as possible. So, how do we get that money to the community? Well, again, it it, um, it depends on the discussions that we have with CMS. It depends on uh, their um, review of both Fairview and well, Porterville and Fairview. Uh, both will require surveys. Um, there, the, uh, there was a, a survey that was recently completed at Fairview. We don't have the final results yet, but uh, there were not, while there were some issues that were identified by uh, the Department of Public Health and CMS, they were not um, significant issues. Uh, so I, I think that um, the, the ability to move money at this point I, I think is contingent upon what happens at these centers depending on how we move them forward. Okay. Let, let's do this. I'm going to ask, I'm gonna, to your, I'm going to help you with your oh, point. I, I'm going to ask Mr. Rogers to, um, to provide us, not today, but information about the transition plan and part of that transition means what happens afterwards. This is clearly a very important issue. I think it's, it could be a conversation in and of itself. We need more information and we need it soon. Um, how much time do you need, Mr. Rogers, so I can satisfy Ms. Gro Ms. Gro's? <laughs> we can do that within this month. I mean, within the within next the month. few weeks. Yes. That seems reasonable. So we're going to get that information because I want it to be answered for you satisfactorily. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Rogers. And with, re with the reservation, we're still re waiting for uh, information to come through as uh, just summarized from uh, CMS. And thank, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And including in that, I'd like to know what your plan would be to think outside the box instead of vesting what I can roughly say 43 plus 12 plus 9. You add it all together plus the 179 positions. You know, that's a significant dollar. Like, so if we didn't do those repairs and we just invested in the community, think outside the box for me and tell me how much money is available. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Thank we'll, you, sir. We'll, we'll start just by looking at what information we have available. We'll look at different scenarios, and we'll, we'll figure out a way to have this be an ongoing conversation until we get it right. And um, that's what I was going to add, uh, Assembly Member, because we'll, we'll share the information you just asked, and then any other questions you can. It's on the flow basis. Excellent. So, okay. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Thank Jones, you. Did, you, did you have anything? Got gotcha. you. Um, Assembly Member, can, can Aaron. I also pr provide some information for at, regarding cost and, and where, where savings come from, right? First of all, I mentioned the four units. Lannerman, when you look at the governor's budget, the governor scores 40, 60 some odd million dollars in savings from closing Lancerman, of which around 46 is net because there are workers' compensation claims that need to be paid and they're figuring it's around $20 million. So there's another $46 million there that's going into the state general fund instead of going back into the community. So that's another chunk of change, all right? I think, I don't know if this, if the sergeant's passed out this, this sheet. That's where I got right. my number. Um, yeah, th this is a very interesting sheet that's put, when put together by the California Disability Services Association, CDSA, whose members obviously represent the community, right, and the community providers who are taking care of 278,000 people with 10,000 more coming in, everybody, because that's what the budget also projects. 10,000 new consumers are going to be joining the community. Um, and when you, if you add up the cumulative savings since 2008, right, this is savings from, in other words, um, from as people get leave the DCs and come into the community, it totals around $400 million since then. Um, 
and that $400 million has gone back into the state general fund. It did not go back into the community. So this is on top of the cuts that the community took, which I want to say is a billion dollars, something like that, that they took over the time of the recession, that they also never saw this $400 million transferred in. So they took in those consumers, right, let alone the caseload growth, because they also were, at that time, we were struggling around caseload growth, if I remember. Um, and they weren't getting COLAs either, right, let alone programs took cuts in rates. And, and so at this point, you've left the community so, it, they are so exposed, okay, and you'll very often you're going to hear from them in, the other, in another panel. I, I actually want to get on to, I do exposure. want to get on to right. our public so, comment. So let's, yeah. let's move and for that. And that $400 million, Thank you. sir, is uh, that $400 million is the 10% increase for the community. Well, we're not going to answer that today, but we are going to talk about the proposed 10% increase in the next panel. Um, I want to thank this panel. I want to invite Assemblymember Dodd to come up. Uh, he's got a number of constituents who've come uh, from his district today, and he's asked for an opportunity to give us some, uh, a few brief remarks um, as we get started, and then we'll hear from the public. Um, welcome, Assemblymember Dodd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And committee members, appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and thanks for giving me uh, the chance to make some brief remarks about the budget uh, for Sonoma Developmental Center, which obviously is located in my district. I'm here today to support, express my support for Governor Brown's proposed 1516 uh, budget for Sonoma Developmental Center. I also want you to know that I do support in investing in community centers for develop, developmental services. But today I'm here specifically to talk to you about SDC. They offer numerous specialized services and medical care that make it a crucial resource for the residents and their families. The budget as proposed recognizes that fact. The state's developmental centers have had some challenges in recent years, and we've heard the LAO's suggestions on how to deal with this. However, the principal concern needs to be with the residents on the health and well-being and the level of care available to them. SDC is home to hundreds of residents, many of whom have lived there for decades. You cannot put a dollar figure on the care for some of our state's neediest and most medically fragile people. It is in the best interest of the residents of SDC, their families, and the 1,200 dedicated staff that work there that SDC is fully funded in the upcoming budget. Sonoma County Supervisor Susan Gorn is here today, and she would, uh, will be addressing uh, this body and um, she chairs a broad-based coalition of community groups advocating for continuing and advancing services at the Sonoma Developmental Center. There are also a number of other advocates including parents of SDC residents who took the time to join us here today on this very important topic. I'd like to thank them for coming to Sacramento and I know that this committee will find their comments very insightful. I'll be working with the rest of the Sonoma County Legislative Delegation and other stakeholders to engage with the governor and DDS to find solutions that ensure that residents are the top priority while addressing budgetary issues which are very, very important uh, throughout the developmental center system. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the committee uh, for the opportunity to address uh, you today in support of the governor's proposed budget and would urge you that when you take action on this item, you support adequate funding for SDC in the 15-16 budget. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Dodd, and we appreciate your advocacy uh, for those who are served at Sonoma Development Center. And, and I can tell you, we hear you. And, um, you know, one of my former, um, you're going to hear from one of my former bosses today at Golden Gate Regional Center. I worked for the other one, too, um, the Regional Center of the East Bay. And uh, he is among those, Jim Burton, who led the closure at Ag News. And always the focus was not just saving dollars, but doing what was in the best interest of the person served. And that was always driven by their individual program plan and their life plan that they helped to write. And so just know that as we have these conversations, we will let that guide us. Um, what can we do to serve the person served? and to make sure that if they're, even if they have medically fragile needs, that we, we balance their ability to live in the community independently. I've worked for a lot of supported living agencies, um, like Full Circle of Choices and others, where we found ways, you know, I worked with Allegria, we found ways to help individuals live independently outside of the developmental centers. And that, our guiding framing will always be what's in the best interest of the person served. So thank you for your advocacy, sir. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to hear from the speakers again. Um, because of the volume of our meeting today, we're asking everyone if you keep it to one minute or less. We don't like to interrupt people, so we ask you to work with us today. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Please, you may begin. Thank you. Because it's not, there I am. Uh, my name is Jackie Dillard Voss. I represent the California Supported Living Network and the STEP program here locally in Sacramento. I'm proud to have been part of the Cofelt Movers. I once again want to reiterate two years, 2,300 people. Ten years, you will have a mortality rate, so you might just have the developmental centers closed in ten years because no one will have the opportunity to live the full inclusive lives that we want people to live. Many of the stories you see in front of you came from the California Supported Living Network, including Joaquin. I just want to reiterate one, one person, James, who left Lanterman Developmental Center. He was the 66th mover, and when I asked the 30-year psych tech that had worked with him, the closest person, what does James like in the community? He said, I don't know. You'll get to find out. He moved into Lanterman at the age of 11. He left there at the age of 49. He now works. He makes his own lunch. They said he could never be around food. So the keys on the keyboard are there for him. The dials on the stove are there for him. He's living a full life. And I see my one minute. I want to also say 110 people are not receiving excellent services according to the federal government. It's time to fully fund the community. I'm tired of the Could same conversation, and I get it. I do. Developmental centers Thank are you. fully funded. I understand. It's time that the community gets some. So I, I'm tired of begging. I am tired of begging Thank you. for the community. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Chairman Thurman, members of the committee. My name is Jim Shorter. I'm executive director of Golden Gate Regional Center. It's hard for me to divide the issues of developmental center and community. Over the years, I've heard this back and forth, but I, it's all the same to me. I'm kind of a li living relic in the system. I've been uh, here talking to the legislature for the last uh, 45 years, um, talking about policy issues and about uh, funding issues. Our system. A story of our system is a story of humanity. It's uh, a story of service to people. And uh, it's a story of brilliant, caring professionals who offer services uh, to our folks. But I'm very concerned that the backbone of the system in the community is breaking. We have people, we're losing people both in the regional center system and in the community provider system because they have to live. <clears throat> <They're clears throat> I'm not one to say this. Could I ask you to make your final <laughs> statement, please? <laughs> I'm just going to give you some numbers then, if that's all the time I have. A social worker at Sonoma Developmental Center makes roughly $87,300. They've had increases from, 19, uh, from 2007 to 2014 of 36 percent, and there are additional increases built into the governor's budget. Sorry, Mr. Shorter, I have to ask you to conclude, please. Thank you. Okay, compare that to 32000 in the core staffing formula for people working at the regional center at Golden Gate Regional Center, we're off by 45 percent, not 10 percent, 45 percent. Thank you, and Mr. Shorter. our community system is the same. Thank you. Thank you, members, for hearing me. Um, I'm, not, I'm also not clear if it's okay that I'm talking about this, but this addresses all the issues as well. My name is Debbie Ellis, and I am uh, the chairperson for the service providers from the San Andreas Regional Center and a provider of service myself and a grandparent. I am here to, today to talk about the crisis that we are in as a provider and the crisis that we are facing staying in business. Uh, we cannot sustain prov uh, providing the services, the various services from transportation to day service to early start with the rates that we are facing um, and have been taken away from us. Um, we support the Lanterman Coalition with the recommendation for the 10% increase. We need to have some kind of cost adjusting 
cost adjusted living and we need to kind of look at how the regional centers also get their money. So if you would just please take all of that into consideration, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Before the next speaker starts, let me clarify on this issue. We're only taking public comment on the developmental centers. In the very next panel, we'll be talking about rate increases. So out of respect, so we hear everyone, I'd like to ask if you're in line to speak now that you speak on the issue before us, the developmental centers. Thanks for waiting. Go ahead. That's a lot of pressure, but I'll go ahead. Um, my name is Terry, and I'm representing a Paradigm, the Salinas um, Monterey area under San Andreas service providers. And I'd like to say um, identity is a hard road to travel, but the fact that you're here today as a panel and listening to us and listening to the voices of all the people who are here and all the families representing the DCs and the closures of the DCs, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, members. Uh, my name is Raymond Fierro. I'm also a, I'm a provider uh, for a supported living agency. And part of the uh, part of being a provider is what we're faced with is is um, doing the assessments and um, accessing the, the individuals into the community and providing that quality of service. And we're at the ground roots. And just wanted to uh, just to provide the testimony and based on. The quality of service that we provide for them is having the, the means to do so. Um, and to provide that quality of service while out, coming out from uh, pe uh, centers like the Porterville, uh, DC's coming out of Porterville, we, are, yeah, we want to provide the same type of services while transitioning out. And thank you for your time. Thank you.